it's fun. What is up, everybody? Welcome to Funkatopia Live, WTF. What's up? <laughs> we are here and yes, ready. I, your host, Mr. Christopher. We have my illustrious co-host, Jeff Page, and today's special guest, the one, the only, Lynn Mabry is in the house. Woo! <laughs> Queen B. Oh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you perfectly fine. All right, yeah, so for those who don't know who Lynn Mabry is, since we're starting the show officially in this capacity, let me just go ahead and tell you, uh, she is a professional vocalist, and she has worked with a laundry list of folk, everybody from uh, Sly Stone, Sly and the Family Stone, Parliament Funkadelic, George Clinton, she was one of the original brides of Funkenstein, Eddie Hazel, Bootsy Collins, uh, Junie Morrison, Talking Heads, uh, Sheila E., who she still works with to this day, uh don henley eric clapton elton john uh chris isaac george michael daughtry the killers stevie oh nicks Fleet, fleetwood mac mick jag i mean it's it's just the we, list just keeps on going it doesn't even make any sense that one person <laughs> can do so friggin' much it's just uh it's yes it is actually it does make sense it does well, make because it, it does make sense it makes total sense. And if you if you hear her, if yeah. you if you've ever been to a show that she's in and heard her voice, you'd understand why she's been everywhere and she'll keep going. And you'll understand it. it just... Yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty magical. We'll just leave yeah. it there. It's pretty friggin' magical. And um absolutely honored to have you on board. And um it's I, I actually posed this question on our uh Facebook page. And I asked the question, I kind of did this long paragraph of the people that you have performed with or, and played with. And and I said, where do you even start? <laughs> where do you even start with somebody like this? Right. So I guess the best way to kind of start it is really kind of find out a little bit about your, your family and where you, um, was it... Uh, was it kind of church that led you into singing? Was it your parents? Were, you know, kind of give me a little bit of a, a background on on how you got started. Yeah, it was a absolute. First of all, thank you both for having me. I'm I'm excited. I'm honored, and let's have some fun. Absolutely. So, uh, yes, it started with church. Oh, mommy and my daddy. That's my mommy and my daddy. Um, but um, I was actually going uh, to church. And living with my mom's sister and husband and their kids, my my cousins and my aunt and uncle, and they had a church, and we, you know, always would participate in whatever. Now everybody knows black churches. You either sing, play guitar, play drums, play bass, or you're an usher. Something, one of those. <laughs> well, I just so happened I was just singing along. You know, I really didn't know that my voice or anything was any different than anybody else's. Everybody in my voice, excuse me, everybody in my family had a nice voice it, to my ear. You know, it was like, so it was normal for me. Um, so yeah, I sang in church all the time uh, with my family and then uh, come to find out, you know, we'd go to different churches and everybody was singing and I would sing along. So um, yes, church singing, absolutely. And then um, when I, became a you know a little older I probably was about 11 or 12 maybe my mom had this uh, uh, Gladys Knight record if I were your woman she used to play it all the time so she played it so much I used to hear it so I started singing along and one day literally I heard my voice and I heard her voice and I was like wow oh, I kind of sound similar but it still the connection wasn't there I just knew that I was enjoying hearing her, but then I was able to keep up. So right. I was crazy at that young of age. And I'm, I'm not, this is not this, I'm just saying that's sort of when the light bulb went off to let me know that, you know, my voice was okay. Right. And then, so after that and everyone is singing in the family, I think I'm probably six, 15, 16 years old. And Sly, which happens to be my second cousin, my mother's first, um, called, and they were very close. They used to like hang out, talk all the time. So um, he called her and said, hey, 
Is she still singing? And actually, my given name, I'm just going to put it all out there because I, I told Chris, I said, I'm kind of an open book. My given name was Peggy Lynn. And so he said, hey, is Peggy Lynn still singing? And, or is she singing? And he said, she said, well, yeah. Now, mind you, I was still in high school. And so um, he said, well, I'm doing a project and I want more of my family to be a part of it. And so, you know, have her come to the studio. So I'm not sure how I got there. I think maybe my mom took me, I can't remember, but I went in and I started uh, singing with him. I literally like, okay. But the first job I ever had was um, I was 16 years old and I'm gonna turn this phone fan on because I'm a little warm. Hope it doesn't make much noise. Um, but, but I was um, 16 years old and I was dating this guy who used to come and pick me up. He was older. He had graduated high school maybe three years prior. And so he picked me up from school one day and he said, hey, I heard that there is a uh, audition for some artists in Jack London Square in Oakland. I went to school in Berkeley. And so he says, and I think you should audition. <laughs> I think you should audition. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> he didn't hear me sing. That's my boyfriend. He heard me. But he said, I think you should audition. And I'm like, okay. I mean, he could have told me to be a freaking firefighter. And I would have said, sure, because right. I was so in love with him. So um, I called, got an appointment to go and audition. Strangely enough, I got the job. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay. So that was literally how it sort of began, you know, Sly being my cousin, but Coke Escovito, which is Sheila's uh, late uncle, mm -hmm. was the artist. And I was 16 years old. And that's how it all kind of got to this point. Wow. There's a couple things that I, I had to ask about this, because the first thing is, uh, how long have you known Sheila? Well, we met then when we were both 16. Wow. And so I met her and her dad, Poppy. I met them. They came to see Coke perform. And he told me, I want you to meet my, my niece and my, my brother. And so that's when I met. But then after that, I didn't see her again. Now, that was probably 1974 or five and uh, maybe five. And then I didn't meet her again and see her again until 1991. So we, we met at 16. But then since 1991, we've been homies. Yeah, you, you know, wow. it's funny because you, you you say strangely enough you were selected. Like you say strangely enough as if yes, to I'm, me at the time it may have felt that way, but yeah, when did. in retrospect when you hear how sultry and how you sound, they they, they can't be like, it's not strange. It it totally right. makes sense to me. And I like I wish I could have been there at that time hearing that audition. You know oh my what I mean? God. And I was so nervous because there was this little woman next to me. She was a woman and she had sheet music. And I'm <laughs> like, oh, I said, was I supposed to know how to read music? And she goes, yes. How else will you know how to sing? And I'm like, oh. Mm. <laughs> so I went up heck of nervous, really feeling like I wasn't, I didn't think I was going to get it. I promise. I didn't. I didn't know. I really didn't. I didn't know. And wow. who was this audition for? This audition was for Sly? Or was it? Yes, no, Coke Espino. That's right, Coke Espino. Yeah, Sheila's uncle. Yeah. Now, were you able to figure out, me being a vocalist myself, when in your career did you really grab a hold of um, uh, actually doing harmonies? Because I don't, I felt like I was always in a lead singer mode, mm -hmm. like from the time that I started. And it hadn't really kind of experimented or really worked in harmonies until right. like later on in my career. It's like I really started focusing on it. Was that something that came naturally naturally to you right out of the gate? Yeah, because I was doing it in church. Yeah. When mm -hmm. I was a kid, that's what we did. We all sang harmonies together. I swear I can hear us now. And so a lot of my family are, are watching right now. But um, my cousin Richard and Pat and Snooky. And I used to always sing, you know, at my aunt's, my other aunt's house, uh, Auntie Doris, and we would sing along with the records and we'd all do, Betcha by Golly Wow. 
<laughs> that was a song, right? And yes, so, yes. but we were singing harmonies, you know, without mm-hmm. issue. So it, it didn't come in my career. It came when I was young. It was just part of it. Okay. All right. So let's talk about Sly Stone because we've got a lot to talk about, a lot of ground to cover as far right. as like some of these some of these artists. But let's talk about Sly and the Family Stone. But yeah. first off, were you aware that? Questlove now has a publishing company that has a book uh, that is coming out that is uh, it uh, pulling up right now. It's thank you for letting me be myself again, a memoir. And apparently right out of the gate, there's this memoir that's coming out with Sly Stone. Were you even aware that this was even happening at all? I wasn't not until recently. Mm -mm. I didn't Mm. even know about it, Mm -mm. but kudos. Oh yeah. It's got to, it's absolutely. Got to be full of adventure, I'm sure. <laughs> and no one and no one interviewed me, so they missed out on some stories. Right, I'm sure. <laughs> it's, it's in another book, but not this one. <laughs> right. And speaking of which, uh, so how did you? Obviously, you uh, were asked to come and perform with Sly. So, you know, what was the first gig that you did with the Sly, and what were you know? Oh, 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 oh. I'm gonna say the first gig might have been on the, ooh, it was either Don Kirshner's rock concert or the Glenn Campbell show. Oh, so this is 70. Way back, yeah, way back. Um, And and there there is actually um, a video of us um, uh, singing the single, Heard You Miss Me, um, that's out there on YouTube somewhere. But yeah, I believe that might have been the first one, somewhere in there. So, was Don Silva already a part of this mix, or were you? Yeah, when I came to sing, which was in the studio, yes, Don was there, um, and then members of his uh, band was there. I think there was some other members too that were there, uh, some other you know older members that uh, what do you call them uh, alumni. But yeah, she was there when I came and I met her then at the, at the session that day. So I guess the question is that, you know, when you get these artists, when you get bands that are like this, and this is obviously, you know, Sly and the Family Stone post Woodstock and everything else. And there's a lot of drug activity and a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of freedom. That's the best way to put it. Yeah. Uh, and you're kind of a kid thrown into this mix. How are you kind of adjusting to to all of a sudden kind of going from this, you know, church lifestyle, everything's pretty, you know, copacetic, and now you're you're in like the land of debauchery. <laughs> right. From innocence to non-innocence. Yeah. Well, well I, I, I have to <laughs> I have to tell you that um my mom, uh, she was an amazing is, she still is, she's still here, but I'm just saying when all this was happening, she was very open and honest with me and hipped me to everything. So when I got, by the time I was singing with him, you know, I had already had a couple of things myself, you know, a little marijuana, um, uh, but not crazy, but I'm just saying it's like, I knew that there was a little, you know, more going on with him because of we're family. So it wasn't anything that I, I'm gonna say I was like, <gasps> you know, shocked about um, at the time uh, because I hadn't been around him often in that vernacular. It was mainly music, church, family reunions, that kind of thing, weddings. So um, when I, I'm gonna say probably the first time that I kind of, my eyebrow went up a little bit was at one of the sessions and it was uh, at the uh, record plant in Sausalito and, it, and the room that we were in, there was like a circle kind of in the round. Mm-hmm. And I remember coming in one day and he and a few of the guys, they were smoking what looked like a hookah pipe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I still didn't know what it was and I didn't have any, thank God, at the time. Um, but I was just like, oh, now this is weird. But young enough to know, my mom taught me, you don't play when it's time to work, you work. There's no no hanging out. So I kind of came in responsible at a young age at the time. Now, later on, I got a little silly, looked at me all. But (laughs) it was, seriously, it was like my mom really taught me how to just take care of business first. And to this day, like, you know, business first, always. So it was okay. It just, you know, of course, it got a little interesting later on. 
when we <clears throat> actually started going on the road together and doing shows mm. out of town together. And then I started mm. saying some things that I was concerned about. And he knew it and everyone knew it because I was his cousin and I, you know, loved him, still love him. And, but that was it, you know, it was just like, I just knew I had to be responsible. And so it was, I was good. I was good. Well, with him being your cousin, were you ever feel like you were in a position where you had to kind of step in and kind of maybe intervene when things were getting out of hand? Yeah, I did yeah. a few times and he wasn't really happy about it. Uh, Don and I used to connive and like, you know, Hey, we have the show to do, so let's hide this. Let's throw that away. And he would. He would. Yeah, I was very protective. I am protective well, of my family for sure. I'm sure you got the mind your business speech <laughs> enough times. Yeah, I got more than that. Right. I got, I got fired after one of them, but amen. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Being being so young and and having, you know, first audition and, and hitting it running. And then moving into Slash Stone and just going and going. At what point did you actually realize, wow, I'm I'm really, I really have this, this pipes. Like this, they really appreciate me. Like when did you appreciate what others were appreciating? Ooh. I'm gonna say maybe it came after Sly with P Funk. Uh mm -hmm. when Don and I got fired and George found out he hired us. And then he said, I'll hire you today. So the same day we got fired, we got hired. And then he started asking us to do sessions. And he would, you know, encourage me, us to sing more. That's when I knew, huh, mm -hmm. like, why am he, why am he, why is he asking me to do this? You know? Right. right. Um, and so that's kind of when I knew that I never felt, honestly, I never felt then like I was something special or I had something unique or different because again, my whole family sings. Right. I'm you, I got some singing family members that ain't no joke. So it wasn't ever that. It was just that he recognized it and then began to acknowledge and tell me. And then I was like, oh, okay. That's kind of when I knew that I could be a serious professional. Let's start there. Mm, mm. I'm, I'm betting that's probably when you started letting go, you know, opening up and finding yourself. Pretty Vocally. much. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, he he gave us sort of almost free reign to do us because he. I remember him having a talk with Don and I, and he just said, "Look, I just want y'all to come in there and do what you always do." Like, just be you. Don't try and hear anybody else. Just do you. I was, mm. that was easy, you know? Okay. <laughs> so you're working with George and obviously, you know, Parliament Funkadelic, and that has got to be um, sliding the family stone. I, I guess if you're going to step into some, into the, the world of Parliament Funkadelic, Sly the Family Stone is a pretty good stepping stone because it's kind of like this. It's a little bit, a little bit of havoc. Mm, but, yes and no, no. But but this Sly, is like no, because with Sly, Chris, we were like wearing gowns and you know doing our three part harmony and step. Yes. And so, so it when I got with Funkadelic, it was like culture shock. Yeah, Sly was I very. I remember when George invited Don and I, which was right before we got fired, to come and see them, you know, just to kind of hang. Because we did, as with Sly, we did open up with them. We went on like a three week tour and we opened up. It was um, Sly, Bootsy, P Funk, okay? And so even then, I was watching, we would like go on, you know, do our thing on stage. And we were like, you know, doing our little, you know, her you miss me higher and then we would sit on the side of the stage and watch them i swear to you we were like who are these people like it was crazy <laughs> but it was so funky it was crazy but it was so enjoyable and the the contrast between the two was pretty significant Wow. Um, so that's why I'm saying when he said, I want y'all to do you. Now, mind you, it wasn't necessarily us being in gowns and, you know, singing, you know, 
like that. But he just wanted our voices. He wanted our tones. He wanted our 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 spirits. You know, we were very, um, you know, everyone, I'm still, I feel I'm a hippie, but we were very, you know, Bay Area girls. And so we were just, you know, follow la 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 and all in there. And he wanted that. Um, mm. You know, I think that he wanted to always add another element to make his whole sound even escalate. So here mm. we go. So which tours were you on with, with Parliament? Do you remember? Obviously, yeah, well, no, well, um, I'm say for sure. Now I'm looking at, I know we did that. I think the first one we did, I'm, I think was Funkin' Teleki, that tour. We definitely did the Motor Booty Affair. We did the One Nation tour. I mean, I literally, I toured with him uh, from 1976, seven, all the way to 1979. So in that six, seven, eight, nine, those four years, all of those tours, we were there. So you saw him walking around naked and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, one time I did sort of uh, see the whole sheet thing. He came out in a sheet and did cut the, the head out and you know the arms and he walked by him. <laughs> yeah, I, I I heard a story of uh, I don't know it wasn't mothership it was something that uh, Sly was on happened to be on stage and uh, he was standing at the bottom of a ladder. And George came down with the sheet, and nothing else underneath. And he kind of came down, <laughs> came down from Sly's right hand side. And when Sly turned around, his business was like right in his face. <laughs> and after the show, after the show, I heard the story of Sly and and uh, him kind of going at it. it. Was like, don't you ever do that to me again? <laughs> Probably. I wasn't there to witness that, but I am not surprised. <laughs> my, my mouth was open. My mouth was open. <laughs> I saw the sheet and I saw the thing. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Oh my gosh. So yeah. yeah, I mean there's just so much going on. It's just it's unbelievable. And of course, you know, then things kind of progress. And um we've got, you know, there, there's actually a lot of different things here. I mean, I I'm I've kind of mixing some photos here, obviously, that's but cool. um, that's baby, that's baby girl. That's me. Oh my god, I look so much like my daughter. Yeah. So these, this was early on, um, uh, and I do uh, recall that's the girl with the bangs. That was the sly girl, you know, and mm. brought that to P-Funk. And then it was very interesting because, you know, once we got with them, you know, at first, you know, we, I had our hairs, you know, like, you know, very conservative. And then all of a sudden we got the corn rolls started coming out. And then mm. we started beads in, you know, you got a little bit more, you know, but um, yeah, it, it was a definitely young me. I will mm -hmm. say that I was new, but I was open. Oh my God, that one. <laughs> we got some amazing photos here that uh, probably some of you have never seen before. And uh, yes, yeah, you need to explain the, uh, the one on the left for us. Well, for sure. that, um, okay, so uh, there was a song that uh, George sang about, and he, we were, Dawn and I were Giggles and Squirm. So that is the rendition of what Giggles and Squirm looks like. And when he told us, that he wanted us to wear these outfits on stage. Let me tell you, I was like, oh, Jesus. Oh, my God. And we were troopers, you know. But I was slightly embarrassed about wearing them, that tail, that worm thing. Right. But we had fun with it. But I will be honest. In the beginning, I was very embarrassed. But that was my least favorite outfit right there. Well, see, everybody had something going on. I mean, oh my god! Right, you didn't stand uh, out. It was all yeah, of you. So. Like, yeah, everybody, everybody seemed to. Even when, in the later years, in the '90s, when I when I've seen them, it was like everybody that's on, and I've seen them in the '80s, and I saw them in the '90s. Um, but it always seemed like everybody was trying to outdo everybody else. Like right. we're trying to get a little bit of attention, you know, whether it be Shider and. Or it's like everybody was trying to do something to kind of just just kind of make it a spectacle, like the whole like they were contributing to the overall spectacle. And it was just it was just yeah. 
much. And I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I don't think they were trying to outdo the next one. I think that they all had their unique yeah. persona and they brought it. So yeah. I, I never really saw any competition with the guys and what they were wearing and how they were dressing. It was just out there, just like with Glenn, with the, you know, the eye and the thing and then the fishnets and the, I was like, what is happening? And then Gary with the diaper, I'm like, dude, for real? Like, oh, seriously, you are wearing a diaper on this stage. On the, on the stage. It, it always came off like, I'm going to be me. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't oh, care. I don't care what anybody says. Totally. This is this is how I feel today. He felt everyone. I believe everyone felt comfortable in their skin when they were performing. But I will say that Gary had one issue. He did not like during the mothership being on that dang course mm. when they had him flying through the air with a gun and everything. And he was. Trying, it scared him. He did not like that. But he did it. He did it. But other other than that, I think everybody was pretty cool because it was their vibe. They brought it. They dressed themselves. They figured out what they want. I don't think George told anybody what to wear, especially the guys and the girls when we first came in. We just made our own little outfits up. And, you know, I went and got went to Capizio and got me a leotard. And I want to say that <laughs> uh, we were with leotards before Miss B. I'm just saying. <laughs> and they weren't crystallized with jewels and everything. But we were doing, we were doing the leotards back in the early 70s. Oh, I remember God. those skates. Yes. yes. Oh my God. That's yeah, that's the One Nation tour. That yeah. was fun too to be able to wear some clothes. Yes. For those just joining us, welcome to Funkatopia Live. We have a very, very special guest, Lynn Mabry, in the house. And uh, she is a vocalist extraordinaire who has played with virtually everybody. And we've, we're have we only like two into it. We've talked about Sly and the Family Stone, and we're talking about Parliament Funkadelic right now. And uh, it's so this obviously took place. Is this filmed at or this photographed at a roller skating rink or? I don't remember whether that was at a rink or not. I just knew we had a, a photo shoot to do and they wanted us all in skates. Mm. And yeah, so there you have it. There we are. I think a few of us, you know, kind of fell a couple of times, including me. But yeah, <laughs> that's what that was. It was just a photo shoot for the tour and, you know, the promotion and stuff. That's yeah. just amazing. Ooh. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, let's talk about this. Uh... Fast forwarding for real. <laughs> no, we're not fast forwarding here. We, we, we got to stop. For those who are listening on the Funked Up app, you probably need to come over to Facebook to facebook.com yeah. slash Funkatopia or youtube.com slash Funkatopia and kind of see some of these photos that we've uh, uh, we've kind of pulled together. Curated. That are, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So much. let's talk about the Christmas photo. Okay, so these are the original brides and parlette. Yes. So mm -hmm. on the bottom is is Dawn, and okay, so if you're looking at the the uh, photo to the left of her, that's Malia Franklin, my girl, <laughs> and then that's me up in the middle with the big smile and the white on the eyebrows, and then you <laughs> have Shirley, and then you also have uh, Jeanette. So they were the original Parlette and Dawn and I were the original brides and we were doing some kind of a photo shoot for a magazine, I believe. And so they wanted to get the original girls and we had our, they put us in these little Santa Claus or Santa Mamas, I don't know what we were, outfits. And it was so much fun, but that's what it was. And I think that's the only photo that the original of both groups are in together like that. Wow. Yeah. That's definitely pretty awesome. Yes, it is. So then, let's. I'm gonna ready to go to the next slide because then George comes comes to you and says, "I have an idea." Mm. So tell us about this idea that he has. Now, the idea you mean of putting us together before the yes. bride? Yeah. So, um, the, you know, Don and I had been singing, um, doing sessions. And then we actually started doing some tour dates with him as well, with them, all of them. And that picture you see on the right, uh, that's Don and I, but then that's uh, Jeanette Washington in the middle. And she um, was the other Parlette. And so we were all on stage together. Of course, there's five of us, right? And George gets an idea in his head. Don't say why, when, how, I don't know, but just like every other brilliant thought he had, 
he wanted to split us up into two female girl groups and make us our own two entities and perform and, you know, of course, do records and all. So um, he, I remember him coming to us and saying, it's going to be two girl groups and it's either going to be the Brides of Funkenstein or Parlette. All right. And I remember my brain kind of going, shoot, which one would I want to be? And then I think, shoot. But then he also said, now the brides will kind of be a little bit more on the pop side and then Parlette will kind of be more on the funk side. And it kind of started going, mm, are we the pop side? Now, mm -hmm. love the name, the Brides of Funkenstein. So I was kind of wanting, because I like the name, but then I'm trying to tell you, Parlette, they were funky. I mm -hmm. mean, I was like, I want to mm -hmm. be like that. <laughs> so it was sort of a you know a little tug of war but then one day he just told us he said okay Lynn and Don you are Brides of Funkstein and other girls you guys are going to be Parlette and it was that's kind of literally how it started and then now mind you George would have all of us the entire band group in the studio all the time and you never knew what you were doing you never knew what song you were singing on or whose record it was going to appear on Somebody had an idea, George had an idea, Gary had an idea, whoever, and everyone just goes in and sings. And so we're, we're just doing a lot of songs. And then finally, when he decided that we were going to be who we were, there were songs that were already in the can for both groups. And then of course, others were added. So um, that, speaking of leotard, that's what I mean. We, that's Dawn and I, when we first, you know, we were the brides. We knew we were the brides. And I think this was our first promo. <laughs> <And, um, laughs> that was our promo photo. Uh, we were serving leotards from Capizio, let me tell you. Boom. <laughs> and fishnet, say what? And I, uh, I think, honestly, I want to say that that was like 1977, late 1977, or very early 78, because our bride's record came out, our uh, album came out in 78. Yeah, it's mm. phenomenal. I mean, it's just, I mean, those, <laughs> I've got the album over there. It's, it's just one of these albums. It's like the Parlet albums, it's, it's all, the, it's just fantastic. It's just unreal. It really I mean, is. At this point in time, uh, you actually um, became pregnant with your daughter and you left the Brides of Funkenstein. Do I have that timeline correct? Well, the opposite. Actually, I left first and then I got pregnant. Okay. Um, my, my little young, immature mind, and all of this, you know, is going to be in a book. Uh, my nephew, Seth, uh, Malia's son, is doing a book called uh, Mothership Connected. So there's going to be a lot of the backstory in the book. So everybody that's uh, funk fans, you got to go because he he knows more about so much than I did because he's he was more of a historian. Mm. I was just living, you know, in the moment. But um, yeah, I almost forgot the question now. Hello. No, we're just talking about your family and speaking to which yes. the fam, my family. Yes. Okay. So the no, no, no. When I quit, so what happened was yes. So Junie was in. Um, the band at this time. Um, and he was doing a lot of arranging and, you know, helping us with vocals and everything. And um, he kind of came in, he kind of wooed me a little bit. And before I knew it, I was smitten. Um, long story short, I remember feeling very um, frustrated. I, I think I was having anxiety. And we were working really hard and we would just like be on stage, get on the bus, travel, get off the bus, do another show. And I think one day I told him that I was really tired, like emotionally, physically tired mm -hmm. um, because I hadn't, we hadn't stopped. I mean, barely. Um, and so he said, well, if you're tired, then just leave. And I'm like, really? Um, and he goes, yeah. And I'm like, Okay. Now, mind you, this is some little young 19 year old girl who has been exposed to a whole lot more than probably any other one. And in my immaturity, well, I will admit that um, I just said, okay. And then he said, well, if you're leaving, let's do it together. 
Mm. So now there's two. And my bad, you know, again, I want you to read the backstory, but um, we left and um, we started, he started working on music. Well, he had actually, he had been working on music uh, for his new record that was gonna come out. But um, one day uh, I recall that we were in, now I have to tell you this, yeah, I think I did get pregnant right at the time that we were leaving, but it wasn't, I got pregnant too and I left. It was, I just happened to be pregnant afterwards. Like it was maybe like a couple of months after we left, I found out that I was pregnant. Oh, and so yeah. that's how we left and um, then had my, my daughter and that was all she wrote. Right. My faith. <laughs> yeah. So how did you, I mean, obviously, how did this relationship with, with Junie start? Obviously, he was in the band and he was working with yeah. you and everything. Yeah, he was, he was so in the did, band. How did you cross over to romantic relationships? Um, just like any other kind of situation, you're around somebody a lot. Um, you get wooed. You get sort of, you know, he, he coddled me. Um, he made me feel like special and not just one of, you know, the big entourage. He, you know, he made me feel like important. Mm -hmm. And and that was like one of the very few handful of times that I kind of felt like I wasn't just, you know, a number or I wasn't just a member. And, um, and I think also I had a thing for keyboard players too. <laughs> that boy played them keyboards and sang. Um, yeah. And um, he was, you know, he had a little side to him. Yeah. So that's kind of, you know, how it happened. And then, you know, and when we, now we were romantic while we were in the band, but then, you know, when we left and then, you know, I was pregnant and then it was like, Hey, then be was a it a scenario? Was it a scenario where they knew you guys had a relationship while in the band yeah. or were you keeping yeah, yeah. it? Okay. Oh yeah. Everyone knew. And yeah. Again, there's a lot of backstory. Everyone knew it wasn't all that great, but amen. Was hmm. there a lot of other relationships that were happening? In yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. This is, listen, this is a black version of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> okay. There it is. There you go. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, so I want to kind of spin off while we're still here in this this parliament realm because I do want to talk a little bit about and try to get a little bit of background about how you got involved working with Eddie Hazel. Oh. And uh specifically I know that you are uh, you're like all over games dames and guitar things oh. I know that. I mean so but, Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But what um kind of talk a little bit about uh how you got connected with Eddie. Obviously this is through the band, but you know, I, I I'm interested in, as how this stuff kind of goes from one segment to another, because your life is full of these moments <laughs> where you're just kind of connected to one thing. And then it kind of just kind of blossoms it's kind of like a, a lava lamp, you know, like the bubble just kind of just pops off and then it goes I, I, I swear, I've always said that my life is a series of segues. Great. Series of blessings. Yeah, it's yeah, it's just one Absolutely. after the other, and all of them are interconnected like this. You, yeah. I mean, you have your own DNA module thing. Just kind of, it's just it's crazy. Let's talk about Eddie. So Eddie was again one of the P Funk, you know, stars, mm -hmm. and we George said, "I want you uh, and Don to sing on his record." I mean, literally, that's what I'm saying. When we joined, he was like, the first one was Fred Wesley and the Horny Horns. That was our first one. And then it went to Eddie Hazel. And then it went to, you know, uh, Bernie. I mean, it's just like who, who's ever, whatever project he was working on. Yep, that was the first one we did. Between two sheets. What? <laughs> <laughs> but with Eddie, um, that was the first, you know, we just knew that we were doing his record. We knew Eddie was a guitar player and was, you know, he did all the, his backstory with P-Funk and we were excited about it. And then the record was kind of cool because it was a little more avant-garde and it was, it was funky, but it had this little thing. And for me, it was a whole lot like Berkeley. So I was really excited. So yeah, 
So that's literally how it happened. We never toured with him, nothing like that. We just did the record. You said, I mean, the involvement with, you know, Fred and uh, Eddie and, of course, Bootsy, who... Bootsy, uh, baby! Because you just had uh, a birthday just a few days ago. Happy belated birthday. And uh, I saw this photo that Bootsy had posted wishing you a happy birthday. And I was like, oh, yeah. I'm going to be on the show. I got to use this photo. Oh, my right. God. He, and he was really also extremely instrumental in getting the bride sound to be what it was. He he really helped us. That How, his what, what, stuff and yeah. all that stuff. And listen, what's cool and crazy is that really, we didn't really know what was going on behind the scenes until kind of after, but he was like, he brought it, he brought it for us. And I am forever, that is forever my brother. I'm trying to tell you every time I see him, there's a big hug fest and he's always been supportive. He's always um, been loving on him some Lynn. So yeah, that's, that. love him. Love oh. So was the instrumental side, was it um, words of wisdom or was it work harder? Like, what was it that really got you there that he? I think it was musically. Mm -hmm. It's what he brought to our sound as well. You know, when we were recording our record. Um, okay. And he just, you know, he just, he was just bootsy being bootsy. And, you know, we had, of course, there were lots of, you know, contributing factors and, and people that were involved in it, you know, but since he's right here, I'm just here to tell you that, you know, he was pretty amazing with us. Mm. Yeah, and how did um, I see that Michael Clip Payne is in the house here? Hello, Michael. What's going on, brother? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. I'm sure he's got, <laughs> Michael's got plenty of stories. Oh, yes, he does. Yes, so I'm does. curious, how Bootsy helped, how did he help you establish your sound? I mean, I, Bootsy, he's just got this very, very distinguishing, distinguishable voice that he he's kind of crafted because you can hear it over his career that he kind of got a little bit more, uh, not cartoony is not the word, but he would go a little bit more over the top than it needed to be. But I, I'm interested in how he helped craft your sound. I don't know. You'd have to ask him. I'm not, I'm not kidding. To mm. me, he was just being Bootsy. And when he was doing some productions or, you know, putting some bass lines or whatever, coming up with stuff, he just did his thing. I, I'm serious. You would have to ask him what his, you know, uh, procedure was or where he, you know, if he was tapping into anything or anybody. I don't know if he was listening to us <clears throat> as, as vocalists. I have no idea. Um, I just know that when he contributed to us, it was poignant. So that would be a Bootsy question. Maybe Bootsy can answer that question for you. Is there something that you remember? I mean, you've got, you're surrounded by what obviously people consider legends. Uh, I mean, George Clinton and Eddie and Bootsy. And is there any specific, and there's probably a lot of them, but is there a specific defining moment, like a fulcrum point of something that somebody said to you or a lesson that you learned during that time with them where you're like, that really made a difference in your career and the way that you kind of carry I, yourself. Yeah. I'm going to say it was Glenn Goins. Glenn mm -hmm. Goins told me like my mother did that I need to take myself more seriously. Oh uh, yeah. Hmm. That'll do it. Cause that, yeah. <laughs> that. that's honestly that, that I remember him telling me that I remember it like it was yesterday. He said, Lynn, you got to take yourself more seriously. Because he, he actually told me that he felt that I was a little lazy with my singing. Mm -hmm. And um, and even though it was a little hard for me to hear that, mm -hmm. I knew what he was talking about because everything I did, I was just comfortable. I was just doing the comfortable me. I wasn't stretching out to do anything you know, beyond my capability realm. I didn't take any risk. I just did feel comfortable. And he told me. Mm. Yeah. In the sea of people that you were working with, I mean, we know it's it's a big family and it's it's just everyone is doing what they do, but you know, everyone's taking care of each other because that's what family does. But did anyone really who stood out as your guardian, like someone who was looking out for you like more often that this is the one who's protecting me. Like you could feel that somebody was, right? Was there anyone? Wow. Who was my guardian? I never thought about that. 
Um, my faith was my guardian for sure. Absolutely. Um, you know, I went through a lot. So I always, you know, prayed or I always, you know, asked God, what is this about? Like, why is this happening? Or what am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, um, over my career, it, again, I said that my my career has been a, a series of segues. And so every artist that I performed with always left me with some type of nugget. Now, not necessarily saying some quote that stuck in my head or you know, uh, did anything, but I got something from everybody, bad, mm -hmm. good, and different. Got something from everybody. And so as far as guardians, I don't know if I ever really had a quote unquote guardian. Hmm. Okay. I don't know. I feel like everybody was watching out for you. Yeah, well, yeah, you'd be surprised at what you, what you don't realize and who's right. actually just somehow looking out for you, even though they're not assigned to, you know Right, I mean? right. And, and, and like I said, and we're talking about like in the business, you know, yes. my mom most definitely was Absolutely. like, you know, she had, that was my, my boo diggity. She, she had it for me. She made me feel, and even though sometimes she did not want me to be out on tour, especially when I had my daughter, she thought I should be at home. However, you know, even in the midst of when she knew it was what I was good at doing and it was my chosen career now um she was you know she always made me feel good she biggest fan mm -hmm. biggest fan like my singing was like if she had to hear anybody it would just be me and she'd be good so, yeah. <laughs> me too oh I'm, I'm gonna fight for a second at yeah. least on the because that's a, that's a big one. Thank you. That's a big one. And this may actually be a really good segue because, um, and you'll probably know where I'm going to segue after this, but Andrew said, uh, obviously, don't forget the wizard Bernie Worrell. Mm. Now, let me tell you, it's true. Like, he gave me a nugget. Like I said, everyone gave me a nugget. Bernie was definitely a supporter of me. He loved my voice. He told me I could do anything I wanted to do. You know, he was... Um, you know, not only was he a supporter, but then he also helped me get to Talking Heads. Uh, right. Because Bernie was with the Talking Heads before, you know, I was. And um, one day I get a call from him and he said, you know, they're looking for another girl and I want to, you know, uh, put your name in the, in the bucket. And I'm like, okay, mind you, I didn't know that much about Talking Heads then. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Same as it ever was. Same, Same as it ever was. I was like, and what? <laughs> However, you know, again, it was a segue into another part of my life that he was, very, you know, it was because of him that I got with the heads for sure. Yeah. And uh, I got the job again. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of one of those things, too, where um, it wasn't an audition audition. Um, I went and I think I sat in at one of the rehearsals or something and just sang a couple things with them. And, you know, I think David was like, hmm. and everybody was like, hmm, OK, um, but yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you kind of get I I'm sorry, I'm getting derailed here because I'm, I'm okay. seeing this comment from Michael Clip Payne, who said she named <laughs> the clip. I did. <laughs> so I did. Great. Okay, so let's backtrack really quickly. Yeah, we're going to re reverse just here for a second because you gave him the rewind, name. Rewind. Okay, so <laughs> um, when when the brides were now the brides and we had a band and we were, you know, dressing and doing stuff, um, he was selected. I don't know if we asked for him. I don't remember. All I know is he was like baby brother anyway, right? So he was our, and this is ages me, us. We called him our valet, but he was our wardrobe person. Okay, he took care mm -hmm. of our wardrobe. When you know he got it to us, he made sure we were wearing what we were wearing. I know it's valet. I know, but it's so old school. Valet. He's trying to say it was valet. I said it was valet. <laughs> and he always wore paper clips everywhere. He had paper clips in his ear. There was, I swear, I think he had paper clips sewn on his jacket. He was all about the paper clip, but the earring. So one day I looked at his, and I just said, hey, Clip. And it, <laughs> it totally stuck. 
<laughs> he took care of us and he has probably a whole lot of stories. And he, you know, and I'm sure even when I wasn't around and he was doing, he, cause he took care of us and he ended up taking care of a lot of us. And, and now he's actually performing with George on stage. He's, he's been with him ever since he never left. Wow. He's got such that iconic voice. It's just like when you hear that deep voice, just start talking. It's just like, Oh, it wasn't, it wasn't that deep when he was taking care of us. He was a baby. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's, all right. So now we're going to fast forward to uh, talking heads, talking heads um, yes. because I love the talking heads. We, you and I were talking on the phone earlier about this, how um, we were so into the talking heads. And this is kind of when you, uh, when you got on my radar was with the talking heads. And because we were that whole, genre with which talking heads and Lori Anderson and uh, I'm trying to think of all the other bands that were in that mix. Um, you know, the fix was obviously in that mix, but there's so many, this is like the total polar opposite from <laughs> where you're at with parliament funkadelic. It's, it's, it's like much, it is a very, very explain this culture shock. What, what, yeah, but again, rem remember, I'm from Berkeley, all right? So mm -hmm. my roots are very, you know, hippie, very avant-garde. You know, I used to literally listen to the Beach Boys and the Rascals and all that stuff, right? So when he, uh, you know, turned me on to this beautiful opportunity and we started, you know, rehearsing and singing, I just sucked it up. <laughs> loved it all. Literally. I yeah. loved what I heard. I loved the songs. I loved the background vocals. And it was fun because the lady that's there with me, Edna Holt, it's her birthday. Holt. Say, Happy birthday, Eddie. Yeah. Um, but she and I, um, it was, I had actually tried to get another friend of mine who was also, uh, again, there's a whole lot of backstory, but um, my other sister friend Val and I wanted her to sing with me with them and she wasn't feeling it. And so when, cause I was trying to get her, but when it didn't happen, then somebody recommended Edna told someone and they told me and I'm like, okay. So she came to rehearsal when we were having a rehearsal and we literally just like, like clicked mm -hmm. and it also happened vocally, which is rare that it just happened. So we started singing together, vibing together. We were friends. We were, you know, we became buddies. You know, we ate together, we roomed together. We, you know, just the whole thing. But it was such, oh my God, I love that picture. Mm -hmm. um, but it was such um, a, a organic connection, both musically and everything else. We literally enjoy each other as a group and it was awesome so again i blended in i adapted to who i was with at that moment and again i don't think long term i don't think well is this what i'm gonna do it just that that picture got an award let me tell you i think it was either the san francisco chronicle la times one of them that got an award, uh, that picture, but that was, uh, we were doing our dance and coming up and coming down that all the braids went up and someone snapped that sucker and there we are. Hmm. Yeah, and we used to, you know, again, like we vibed, we danced, we enjoyed ourselves. And now David, which is a little bit different from George, David had, he had more choreography with himself. Like he literally looked in the mirror and like he worked out every dance step that he, every movement that he did, everything was choreographed. So what Edna and I would do, would we would pay attention to him and do steps to coordinate with him. Mm -hmm. so, and, but singing, you know, we just, we just did our thing. How so long stop making sense just made sense. It just made sense. It just made sense. <laughs> How long did it take him to notice that you were choreographing with him? I mean, did he notice right away? Did he make any comment? I think it happened organically. You know, like we, we would do some things. Like there were some things that he wanted us to do. Like there was this song. Uh, mm, 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 mm. What is that one? Oh, shoot. I'm so, I'm horrible with titles and names. 
I have so many songs in my head. But anyway, there's this one song where he's jogging, right? We're all jogging. And then one day he went around the stage and then we're like, oh, okay. I don't know if he told us or we just decided to do it with him. Next thing you know, we're all just jogging. I was in the best shape on that tour. <laughs> we jogged, literally jogged oh, every cool. show. And it was fun. It was so much fun. And then, you know, again, um, it was sort of like what George allowed with me. He allowed our voices to be our voices. He wasn't trying to make us sound like anybody. So mm -hmm. he loved who we were, and we just added to the talking head sound. Yeah, I think I have a clip. I don't know. It's like a 27. Yes, so no. much. Yeah, and that's going to be the problem is that <laughs> Facebook people are probably going to be start being kicked off now. I'm sorry. Uh, you no, know, it's, <laughs> it's not your fault. It's my fault uh, because I thought I would actually have a little bit of control over the volume, uh, but I didn't. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's just one of these I things. Know. I know. Um, we might have been under the time, but uh, somebody's going to hit it. That's, that's what yeah, they do. So, if, so Facebook folks, if you start getting kicked off, go to youtube.com slash Funkatopia, youtube.com slash Funkatopia. You can still watch on Facebook. You just can't uh, contribute via chat and everything. So uh, just know. Just Facebook is I just love the vibe that you guys had with um, with talking heads. It was just it was there was something yeah, organic was the right word. It was just everything just fit. And I don't yeah. think really people looked at David Byrne like a, 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 a any kind of you know, really funky guy, but he had this bounce and this cadence that was and then you guys kind of layered in and made it yeah i just kind of just they just painted this whole picture it was just and stop making sense was such a fantastic movie and i gotta imagine that that movie for you was phenomenal i mean uh i guess maybe from a paycheck perspective did you get did you even know that what was going on oh okay we got a story here folks uh so let's go down with somewhere else however i'm gonna okay. say this we just did the concert and we knew that it was going to be filmed. What you saw was just one of our concerts and then camera showed up and Jonathan Demi fell in love with him. He was so awesome, mm. but we had no idea the magnitude, not at all. Right. No idea. There was no, and like, I knew it was going to be a, a doc, not a documentary. But I knew it was going to be a kind of like a film, a music, Doc film, whatever, but I didn't know the magnitude of it. And I had um, a friend of mine because I didn't have a manager or anything at the time. So I had one of my best guy friends. I was like, look, can you like go in and, and be like my manager and find out what the heck's going on? He was like, sure. Hmm. And so he uh, went and talked to their manager at the time and they said, oh, everything will be fine. We'll take care of them. Let's shake on it. They had that gentleman's handshake and that was it. Hmm. So a story however, for another time. Yeah. However, it does not take away from how grateful and honored mm -hmm. and blessed mm -hmm. I am to be a part of that film. I'm telling you. Right. I'm right. blessed and happy. I am. And uh, David Kuzma in the chat area is saying that uh, it is about to be reissued. Yes. Yes. So you like rework, rework some of your contract as far as the... Uh, I'm gonna right. let the union, hey, I'm gonna let the union take care of that one. Yeah, there you go. Because <laughs> they will. Yeah. Times all right. have changed. It's all good. I swear. It's all good. Yeah, and uh, I know people are asking me about the making of the brides album since we've already kind of passed the, the brides yeah. of uh Funkenstein, but I imagine that all that stuff is gonna be in the book and there's gonna be like lots of, yeah. of stuff. Yeah. don't want to give away everything here, but I do want to talk about a relationship that you guys that you have, um, which is obviously more current right now, and that is with this lovely lady who uh, we, were who we worship here and adore. Yep, uh, Miss Sheila E. Force of nature, that one. Oh, yes, Force absolutely, of nature. absolutely. Yeah. 
Uh, she was, yeah, she was just, she was an absolute force of nature. And uh, Susie was like, any Prince stories? I knew that, I knew that question was going to come up, but I, I warned you that that was going to come up, but yeah. There may be a couple. They may maybe a couple of print stories in here. We're gonna we're gonna talk about those in a second. But right I'll now, you, I'll give you one or two. That's it. All right, we're gonna, but we'll we'll segue into those from Sheila E. So yeah, the, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was gonna say because the the two of you on stage is a force of nature. Oh my god! Like, oh, let me let me I hold on a second. I I, I got to show you this. Speaking of which, I I did not know that. Uh, I did not know she had it going on like this. Watch the this is a little clip of uh, Lynn. Watch this. The story of our professional <laughs> relationship. That girl will push everybody out of their comfort zone. So honestly, what happened was she just vibes. And so one night, we it was a great show. So she started telling, she says, everybody in my band does all kinds of stuff. So she said, come on over here and play drums. So she had somebody, one of the guys play drums, did really well. I think that was uh, Bertrand or whatever. And then she had another person play drums. And then she and then so she goes, okay, Lynn, your turn. I'm like, hey, I was like, oh Jesus. And so I went over there and I just literally never before have I done that? Ever. Bro, it, it, that was her. That was her. was your first time ever doing it, that's pretty impressive. I'm yeah. Wow. I mean, I have, you know, basic rhythm, you know, I can, but drumming. I always tell Sheila, I said, I just still to this day now, I have worked with Sheila for a few decades now, okay? I'm still in awe of when she plays those drums with a smile on her face. I don't get it. Yeah. She'll be like, <laughs> <laughs> and she's just, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So she, um, you know, pushes us. She pushes me. She always has. Sometimes I'm, I'm like, I need you to like a great story. Um, this is early in our working together and it was a sex symbol tour. And um, there was this one part of the song where there's a rap and she goes, Lynn, I need you to like shadow me. And I was like, what? Oh, is this where she's doing the trans Mississippi rap? And she wanted me to sing with her. I said, Oh, I don't rap. She was like, hey, you. I said, Oh no, I don't. <laughs> Long story short. I didn't. I tried. But I didn't. When she, I think she laughed, not at me, but it was pretty funny. Um, but yeah, she she is a force of nature, and I love her. It just sometimes she wants me to do stuff. It's just like no. <laughs> we it's, have so much fun. And I was gonna say too, because uh, you said it, and someone else said it, that the chemistry that we have on stage, we have that because we are buddies. We are friends. We are sisters. You know. Yeah care for each other so that translates when you're on stage i don't know if you've ever seen a show and nobody will look at the other person it, it you know that's not us you know like we vibe off and have a lot of fun together and so it really helps that when you are friends first and then you work together sky's the limit sky's the limit that's my dog that's my girl yeah. yeah, you guys, I mean, just watching you guys on stage, you work, it's so much fun to watch. And then when you start hitting those low notes, <laughs> I know my voice goes, goes higher. <laughs> I said, okay, yeah. it's fun. It's fun. We have a good time. And I have to tell you, even that in, in that part, and please, you guys, if you're ever, you know, you hear that we're performing in your area, come see us. But even that was something organic that happened one one time. And you know, it just, we just started singing and the 
the song, the notes or whatever went down. And I just said, well, let me see how low I can go. And then she chimed in and she was just like, more, <laughs> more. And man. Then, yeah, I and, love and when you yeah, Sly the Family Stone yeah. songs and stuff like that. No, the huh? Sly the Family Stone songs and stuff is just that's. Uh, yeah, we do that sometimes. We don't do that as much anymore. We got some new ones now, so you got to come and check it out. Oh, we did. Yeah, yeah we did. We we were just at the yeah, last. We were, show. Yeah. Mm, we're just at the last. Yeah. Uh, yes, she. Those of you who haven't seen the show, you need to go. She's right because what you'll end up getting is one of these, and I've got her signature right there. Yeah. You. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. So. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's a fantastic album, by the way. I've been meaning to to write uh, the review on on this CD, which is absolutely phenomenal. I think you, there are actually still some autographed ones available uh, through whatever that. that yeah, you is. have to go on SheilaE.com for those. Those are special. You go on so there's a brand new album out that you guys are working on called Hella. Well, done with called Hella Funky, and mm -hmm. it is a fantastic album. Really, I is. agree. It I is agree. It is, it is one of the faves, um, you know, it's kind of weird too, because all of Sheila's records that I've been a part of, I love them all. So that's kind of, I'm a little biased. However, this CD, because it was done live, they did it with the music, you know, the band, they did it live in the studio and then we did the vocals afterwards. But I, listen, when she sent me the files for the CD, I couldn't get past the first song, y'all. Listen to the first song, and I need you to just take a break. I need you to just let it soak in because that song is so funky. I mean, get it in a nice system, whether it's in your headphones. I was in my car. I literally stopped, and I put the video on. I screamed to the band. I'm like, y'all are stupid. I was like, I, it is um, the musicianship with this band yeah. is another level. Yeah, that's the absolutely. Yeah, you know, the first three songs, I believe it's the first three songs are instrumental um, on this album, which was very, very different from anything that Sheila's done before uh, on her albums. But the first three songs are instrumental and they are, it's just, it, it's, you can tell, I, I think that's, that's a great thing is that she gets to really show off her musicianship and the band gets to show off their musicianship and just, which, which is something that you've always just kind of just taken for granted because there's always vocals in the front of it. But in this case, everything is out there and it's so well produced that it's just, you can hear everything very, very clearly. Um, it is a fantastic, it's probably one of Sheila's best albums he's done in a really long time. I, I, I want to interject real quickly because Sheila E and the E Train, that is her, you know, that instrumental, you know, the jazzy, jazzy, funky situation. There's two more records out there too, prior to this one. This one is my favorite, yes, indeed. But how, mm -hmm. wait, the other two are pretty amazing. One is uh, Rites of Passage and the other one is Heaven. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So if you have the ability to get them, you should, because they are, but this one, this one is, Hella funky. Hella funky. It's hella funky. <laughs> yeah, yep. it is definitely hella funky. And I got we do have a couple more shots here just to kind of show wow, you. Yay. Oh my yes. God. Yes. So I think the one on the left, we were celebrating her birthday in, in Minneapolis. That was so much fun. That's that was another killer show. And then to the right is when she and her dad received the Latin Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. Oh, so we yeah. were just backstage. We were actually, that was in the, uh, her hotel suite, but we, it was just such an honor. And I was just so proud of her and Poppy. So yeah, that was fun. Yeah. It's just amazing. I was just kind of just looking at through some of these photos. Now I want to talk about the magic hour. Oh, <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Yes. So, um, uh, Sheila was asked to, uh, be the, uh, first late night female music director for the magic hour for his, uh, show and it was wonderful. And I think we did it in 1998, right? Yeah. Mm. 1998. And it was so much fun. Band was amazing. Um, I don't, I know that's Kat Dyson up there and Peter Michael, uh, was playing. And I think there's a Kat Gray was on keyboards and, uh, let's see, John, Paris was on drums. And I remember this. And Sheila oh. E was, I was so obsessed with Sheila E that I don't know that I ever noticed that Kat Dyson was in this band. Right. Hey, killer, killer band right there. Let me tell you. Oh my God. Oh boy, Grace. Oh my God. Everything. And that's another great thing about being a part of Sheila's life musically is that, man, she gets killer musicians so much. So a lot of people take them from her. 
Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then right. I'll just keep it at that. All the good ones are taken. <laughs> or or they're just, you know, taken yeah. someplace else. But yeah, absolutely. Always just... drawn to great musicians all the time. Mm-hmm. All, and 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 listen, when you do a Sheila E show, and if you've done it for the first time, like this one we just did in Phoenix, um, our our bass player who's on the record, of course, um, Raymond, he was doing another project in Europe. So Wes, the drummer, um, recommended this guy bass player. And so he got the music and, you know, he came to the show. Good God almighty and killed it. <laughs> so you know who we're talking about. Anyway, I'm, I, I just, I'm just going to say that everybody that performs with her, you know, that they are amazing. If you had a chance to perform with Sheila E, that means that you got something going. Mm. Yeah. So, and I know that this is kind of, this is probably a good segue, uh, into the Prince question, because I know that you've, you've actually played with Prince on a few live shows, but you were always with Sheila. Like every time that I've seen the lineup, whenever you're on the same stage with Prince, Sheila mm-hmm. is there. So you're, I guess you're kind of come as Sheila's entourage. It was, yeah, it was, I was managing her at the time. So that's another situation. I managed her for years now. That picture is a still shot that I literally grabbed off from. We were doing, I believe that was, was that? Alma Awards. Almost, yeah. yeah. And so I was managing Sheila. We're at rehearsal. I'm sitting down on my computer, emails or whatever. And all of a sudden on the mic, he goes, Lynn. And I look up. He said, can you come here for a second? I said, oh, sure. Thought he had a question. He wanted me to get something. I don't know. And I walked up to him and he said, and I was like, how can I, he said, get on that mic right there. I said, huh? He said, just get on the mic and just start singing. <laughs> That's how that happened. I was not supposed to be, I was not in the band. He just wanted me to sing. And so I said, okay. Um, and he had known, of course, you know, he had knew who I was. He knew who were, you know, my, who had sung with, he knew about George, he knew about Sly, you know, so he knew that I could sing, but I was managing. I wasn't singing at that particular segment of my life. But for that show, he made sure I sang, and there, there it was. It yeah, was fun. I, I just think that the thing is interesting about it, because I know that you, it was the Alma Award, you also sang at the House of Blues in June of 2004. Uh, there's another one. Um, I'm going to ask you this question too, but the, because, the, but I want to hear this story first. The MGM Hotel at Studio 54. Uh, you were singing on stage with Prince, but you were singing background vocals alongside Cindy Lauper. Do you remember this? Was that me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> according, to Vault, according to Prince Vault, you were on stage uh, at the MGM Hotel, which was called Studio 54. They, I guess you know, I if, it, if, if that happened, it wasn't a planned thing. You know, if, if I honestly don't, I remember sometimes being on stage with him, like he would call us up and or whatever, and we would dance or something weird like that. Right. But it wasn't like a gig. So mm. if I were there, if I was there, it was just because man. And the earlier one that I'm seeing here is May fifth, two thousand three. It was a one-off show, and you were guesting with uh, Pete Escovito, and it was Prince Sheila E and Raphael Sadiq. Do you remember that? Oh show? well, then again, that's one of those me just getting up there and. <laughs> you know, so we did. There was this show that we did. It was here, I think, in L.A. Oh, my God. I wish Sheila was on so she could type it or remember. But it was at one of these clubs, like on Ventura in the Valley. And and uh, Prince came and loved it. And I think he got on stage with us or something for a minute. But again, you know, even when I met him years ago when Brides, we were doing some show at some nightclub. And, you know, wait, wait, wait. you met him when you were with the Brides? He came to one of our shows. Jesse Johnson brought him to one of our shows. Oh, okay, well, hold on. This is a story in itself. Wait a second. That's all I'm going to say. You got to read the rest in the book. <laughs> I don't know. Hold on. Come now on. Clip now. You, come on now. I, I've got to hear that. At least, at least give I me a little I just told you that we were doing a show. Okay. And in the back, we see the silhouette. And then someone says, is that? And we look, oh my God, that's him. And so we like, we're singing a song. We said, hey, Prince, come on up stage. And you know, he didn't really want to come. We're like, come on, come on. I don't know what Jesse said, but he came on stage. 
and then you have to read the rest of the book. Mothership connected, Joe. Oh my that's word! It. That's all you're gonna get. But that's okay. when I met him. That's when I met him first. Wow, Jesse. Wow. But listen, kind of like Sheila, didn't see him again for years. Same situation. Ah, uh, wow. Still, <laughs> just just, uh, <laughs> just amazing. You know what? I swear to you guys, I'm so blessed. I, I'm so grateful and I'm so blessed of all of the. Somebody dropping and saying hello. Who's coming to say hello? Who's going to say hello? <laughs> it should be at the bottom of your screen there, Sheila. Hi, Chow Chow. Hi, Mama. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it, I, I think it's just amazing. Just the, the uh, again, your, your resume is just ridiculous. It doesn't, I, it, it defies logic the way that I guess it doesn't defy God's logic. No. It, but hmm. just the way that things just kind of just threaded together in a way that only God can put it together. Absolutely. There's like no right. Things just don't work out like this in the normal flow. It, it's it's just it's just yeah. not. I, I mean, when when we were setting up for this interview and I was like trying to get some information to you and it kind of hit me again of mm. everyone that I have been in contribution to. Right. Some I would forget because it's been so many years ago. I might do a session here. Someone will call me for a session there. And, you know, I I'm just again, it's like. I never planned for any of this, y'all. I was going to be a psychologist. I was accepted <laughs> to Davis University and Santa Cruz University, I believe. And I wasn't planning on singing. That was not, you know, I sang in church. That was in my, you know, but God did have another plan. And yep. uh, because, you know, I, my daughter's here because I'm singing. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I am so grateful and as hard and as difficult as it was at times. It was not always easy. I sacrificed a lot. I did a lot of things. I necessarily wasn't, you know, didn't think that it was in the plan that I would do or sing people that I would sing with or whatever, but it was always awesome. Like, you know, getting, I'm just going to, I'm not throwing it out, but I, this was one of those times that I just knew it was God when I got the George Michael gig. Nikki mm. Harris, it was, it was like 300, I think, women who had auditioned. It got down to me and Nikki Harris. Everybody in the world, y'all know who she is, of another force of nature. Mm -hmm. I, she was first and I was second. I was sitting outside the room and she was singing um, the Aretha Franklin song, the one that they did, I didn't fall with the George. And I was like, oh, that's it. I'm just gonna go in and say hello. She came out, I said, congratulations. She says, what are you talking about? I said, girl. <laughs> I'm still thinking about it, right? Yeah. I I just do me. I just do me. I go in and next thing I know, I get the phone call that I got the gig. I come to the first rehearsal and the, one of the first things I did, I asked the music director, I said, can I ask you, why did you guys pick me over Nikki? And she mm. said, because we liked your blend. Mm. Because again, I, I was always, what do you call, um, I was never thinking about being a lead singer. Right. So everything that I did was always background related. So I wanted to make sure that everything I did blended in. Whoever I sang with, I tried to sound like their background vocals. If they already had the, I wanted to sound like that. I did it with Bet. Bet Mittler was the same thing. I okay. did that. When I, yep. I went in and I'm like, I I love her and I studied her anyway. And I said, I'm just going to sound like what I hear. Right. That's right. what it was. It wasn't. I was, you know, and and. When you blend, when you blending is not a negative, blending in is not a negative, it's harmony, right? Life like harmony is everything. I love harmony, y'all. Everybody will tell you, we go in the studio and I'll have 700 different parts in harmony. Um, but harmony is everything to me, that's contribution, that's what I love. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, and speaking of harmony, I know we were, uh, I actually rented this movie because for some reason I hadn't seen it yet, but I actually rented this movie, uh -huh. uh, which was uh, <laughs> 20 feet from stardom. Uh, who, if you have not seen it, it is a fa fantastic, fantastic movie about uh, 
you know, background vocalist and just vocalist in general, some who aspired to, to greater things. And, you know, there's mm-hmm. a long section on Judith Hill that was in there, but Lynn, you had a couple of really good parts in there. But I think one of the things that I think is really, really important. One of the things that you said, uh, you just said was that, if you're a vocalist paying attention to what they're already doing, what are they, what right. is that artist that you're about to work for? What, is, what is it? What is the sound that they gravitate towards when they're looking for vocalists? Who do their, yep. pre, you know, their background vocals, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I do have a question because 20 feet of stardom is full oh. uh, of amazing, amazing vocalists. Um, uh, Darling Love, and it's it's just like this long. And I have to get, I have to do a shout out because it was because of Lisa Fisher, a friend of mine, who is also one of the lead features in that. She is the one who recommended me to Gil Friesen to do an interview. She told mm. me about my career, and they interviewed me. I had no idea. Once again, I just thought I was being interviewed for some documentary. I had no idea the magnitude of that one. It was a learning experience for me, but I mean because of Lisa amazing woman um, artist. She is the one who recommended me for that. But I learned a lot. Like you said, I learned a lot about all of us. Like everybody, our our path is different, mm-hmm. but it doesn't make us any less special. It's just our path is different. And so another blessing to be a right. part of this. And it won the Oscar in 2014, y'all. I, I, that's what I was just about to say. It's like you did... The same exact thing happened with Stop Making Sense. It's like you it was being filmed. You really didn't know what was going on. You personally and boom. was happening, and then it just blew up. Right. Same thing with this. You just kind of participated because you felt like it, you could contribute something that was worthwhile for the movie, and you did it. <laughs> it worked winning. Everything you touch is like hmm. it's, it's got gold attached to it. Everything you. you touch. I mean, you. is there somebody background vocalist wise, even before, even in the younger days, did you pay attention to background vocalists on albums or, you know, stuff that you heard on the radio? Who was the first, let me ask this, let me rephrase this question. Who was the first background vocalist that really got your attention? You were like, who's that? What are they doing? Even that. Yeah. Maybe- See, again, it wasn't one person like that. Like, the person who touched me to sing was Gladys Knight. Yeah. If I were your woman, I was singing along with her. I was like, oh my God. Right. And I met her and told her the story. I was like, because of you. Yeah. Um, but as far as background singers, um, I never listened to one. I listened to them like as a unit. I remember hearing uh, Patti LaBelle singers were really awesome. Can't remember mm-hmm. their names necessarily, but Luther. Oh, geez. Mm. Okay. And Lisa was a part of it. Mm. Those singers were like, I'm like, for real? Right. Like, like and, and then he would have them do their thing. And and I, I couldn't believe it. So I'm going to say probably Luther's group probably made my, you know, my eyes twitch. And Luther was a teacher. I, that was something I learned from the movie. I had no idea that Luther sang background on the David Bowie. I know. Mm. Yeah. I was like, what? No, it was a, it's a historic, I'm, I tell you, it's a history lesson if people, yeah, it's, it's worth saying, but yeah. yeah. Um, I think I, I'm, I'm going to say for sure that uh, collection was really, really amazing. But then again, there were groups that I used to listen to that, you know, got my ear. Aside mm-hmm. from my family, Sly, of course, and Rose and Freddie and everybody that sang, that was like, okay, that was amazing, right? Um, but there were other groups like Karen Carpenter, Loved tone. Mm. I felt like Karen Carpenter. She had a. I had a tone like she did. So mm. I loved hearing her and singing along with her songs because I I resonated with that. But it was you know they were like a group. So you know I I I am I am different when it comes to a lot of singers that could tell you every vocalist every. Da, 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 da. Mm. I just sort of you know it, listened and enjoyed and then took it in and then gave. Um, and sometimes, you know, they're artists. I'm like, I tell you, like, I wouldn't even know who they were, but they sounded so good. Like I, I remember the song, like I said in the beginning, I was in junior high school and I heard the sail on, sail on, sailor. <sighs> the voice, right? I freaked out. I'm like, <laughs> I was like, 
Yes, had no idea it was the Beach Boys. Again, it was the song that touched me. So that's how it has been with my life and my career. The song will touch me and then I will listen to it. And oftentimes I won't even know who it is. Like, but there's some people out right now, you know, that I just, I, I'm a uh, love gospel music still. I'm more contemporary Christian music. And there's just some singers with some tones that I'm just like, oh my God, you people. And it's mm. wonderful, just wonderful. And who is this new uh, R&B girl, this Coco child? And Jasmine Sullivan, and I'm like, and never again. That's not my lane, y'all. You know, right. Lane is what I do, and I'm thankful for it. But some of these people out here, I can't even. Like I said, I can't even no. name them. I, I I don't know them all. I just know that, you know, I listen. Like I said, I listen and I receive. Mm -hmm. It's me. I, I I I get what you're saying as far as the they need to all melt you just kind of listen to them collectively. I think if right. somebody does stand out, it's kind of, they should be out in front. Like the, the first background vocalist I can remember hearing that I was able to readily identify when I heard him was Michael McDonald. Ooh. When you hear like Steely Dan albums and you hear, oh. his, you hear his vocals in the background, you're like, that's Michael. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. exactly. Now, mind you though, like when I first heard it, I didn't know. I'm just hearing that. I hear that person. I hear that that sound that just resonated. So yeah, I love Michael McDonald. His oh, he's voice, just amazing. Oh, forget about it. All right, let's do some. Let's do some quick hits here. Let's uh, let's look at this one right here. We are pulling oh, Don Henley. Yeah. Don Henley. Yeah. You work with Don Henley. So tell me about somebody. Obviously, this is collective group here this is yeah so when i sang with don henley I, you know there there was another there's another segue um started working with him and who am i singing with was dolet mcdonald who i sang with first with the talking heads when i first joined but she that was like very and then she left and then in the middle miss blondie that's cheryl crow <laughs> What? So, yes, so it was <laughs> the last show crow and myself. <laughs> I know this, my, and we had so much fun. And see, Cheryl knew Don, and they had worked together and wrote together and did some stuff together. And then, you know, I knew Jolette from the Talking Heads thing and me. And we had so much fun. And we did the um, Last Worthless Evening, I believe. Was that the Last Worthless Evening video? Last Worthless Evening, yeah. 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 And then um, the picture, uh, oh, the one to the right at the bottom, that's Cheryl and Edie Brickell. What I am is what I am. Yeah. They had one oh. album, the New Bohemians had one album, and then she got married to, to Paul Simon and then disappeared. And there you go. <laughs> there you have it. You she know. fell in love with Paul Simon, and they just there won. You that's, hey, you know, that's her lane. That was what she wanted to do. Eh? Right. Yeah. But that, I, I have to tell you that, that was one one of my favorite backing vocal groups that I had worked with, like the three of us together. The sound was amazing. We didn't sing as much and often. And what's really weird, it's like I cannot find any live shows of the three of us with him anywhere. I've looked. <clears throat> that video is the only thing that I could find uh, that's still out there. But um, the sound was amazing. If anybody has it, Don, if you're listening, if you got it somewhere, share it with a sister because it was awesome. The band was awesome. The sound was awesome. He I loved. Again, when I used to hear the Eagles, his voice stood out. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, of course. Right. Thankfully, I started working with him when he was doing his solo stuff. But yeah, that was fun. Yeah. And that was also I was we used to I was very healthy because we had a Stairmaster that traveled with us in the truck, <laughs> brought it backstage. And every time before dinner, each time, each of us would take turns on that Stairmaster. But yes, Cheryl Crow to let McDonald. Yeah. The, that's the Eagle story goes was that they, he wasn't the normal singer and they just let him sing. Uh, they let him sing a track and they were like, Oh, okay. We're, we're done here. You're good. <laughs> right. You're oh. sing a lot more now. <laughs> no, you, can't, you can't deny. You can't deny his voice. And he was a pretty good drummer, too. Yes. And so Cheryl Crow, was she the connection for this next thing here with Eric Clapton? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. Um, Cheryl I, Crow did thing with Eric Clapton. Matter of fact, uh, Eric Clapton is the source or 
of her song my favorite mistake uh a lot of people didn't know that um mm -hmm. but so we got clapton on left hand side and elton john on the right so let's talk about clapton first how'd you get it okay so clapton i was in trader joe's and ran into a person that i knew god forgive me right now because the name is escaping me but he was producing uh but he didn't tell me. He just said, hey, you know what? He said, how you doing, Lynn? Are you still singing? I said, oh, you know, a little bit. And at the time, I wasn't. I had, I was on hiatus. I was, had stopped managing Sheila. I was just being me by myself, me and my dog in my apartment. And I went to go get some food. And there he was. And he said, oh, he said, we were just talking about you. We were just saying that we wish we had a Lynn Mabry voice on this particular song. And I said, oh, call me. He said, really? I said, yeah, my number's the same. My number hadn't changed. I get a call and I, he says, okay. Um, he says, so we're doing this. Um, I'm doing this project with Eric Clapton. I was like, oh, he said, so just give me, if you have another singer, you can call and we'll do it together. So I called a friend of mine, Deborah Parson. I said, come on, let's go and sing with this dude. Hmm. Eric was not there and the arranger, I mean, and the engineer. And we did the songs. That was it. Had fun. Hmm. Yeah. That was it. That was literally the connection. And I will tell you that. Since we did the record, I have not seen him or talked to him, Eric. But well, they've got you performing on two songs on that Clapton album. Run we back. Actually, we actually did five total, but I think uh, only two or three made it. And mm -hmm. well, "Run Back to Your Side" was one of them, and the other one was "Diamonds in the Rain." Mm -hmm. And "Diamonds in the Rain," you were singing background vocals with Cheryl Crow. Yes, but she Nick, wasn't there. And Nick Acosta. Nick Acosta was Nick there? there either. <laughs> they added them in later or we they added us on top of them i don't know how the sequence happened but yeah and then i'm assuming the london symphony orchestra was not there either it's not there either, <laughs> not there either. but that's the beauty of music you know everyone is not there when you're doing a record except technology for but no no yeah that was and it was i mean i was glad to do it it was great and then next and then elton john okay so um oh my god greg oh god Forgive me, Greg. Her, her, her. Greg, producer, didn't know I was singing. This is another one. I get a call. I said, oh, you were recommended by someone else because I had done uh, the Killers or either Brandon Flowers or Hozier, one of them, and he also produced them. So he says, I'm producing a, a project right now, a song, and I want you, you were recommended, highly recommended, and I'd love for you to be a part of it. I said, oh, okay. So he said, I, can you get me uh, two other singers? I said, absolutely. I called Judith Hill and Jackie Goucher. We go to, nice. we go, we get to the house, beautiful house of some in, in LA somewhere, go down to the studio and we're like, so what are we doing? So they play the song and it's the Elton John song. Don't let the sun go down on me. Nope. Oh, now that duet. Don't let the sun. I did. Now that one was with George Michael. George Michael, right? And Thanks. so um, that was long time ago when I was singing with George and uh, Elton came on stage and they did "Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me" as a duet together. So then we <laughs> sang, and then when they went to the studio to do, you know, to fix it up, and then George said, "I don't like the way the vocals sound," so he had me come in by myself. I did all the vocals so that's another little history i did all the vocals on that song when you hear it on the radio that's just me singing back up with george and elton but i did the for the rocket man movie we did i'm gonna love you again and that was the song that we did in the session for elton and i was like y'all have to tell you had to tell somebody we're doing something for elton i just thought we were doing some random you know demo for somebody and again that song won the Oscar. Look at you. Look at you. You, just like, oh, oh. you are an Oscar magnet, my lady. Well, <laughs> I, I'm so excited, but we didn't get a we didn't get a, a statue. Matter of fact, my my roommate, my friend, she and and a couple other friends when when uh, the 20 feet from Stardom, we got the Oscar for that. <laughs> she got me with a little fake baby. It was a little Oscar. <laughs> Lynn made me for your contribution. <laughs> the 25th, I'm sorry, just so I can have it on my desk right now. But anyway. And speaking of which, uh, let's kind of, kind of go a little bit of timeline. Let's talk about George Michael. You and George 
uh, George loved you. Mm-hmm. I loved him. Um, it was there was so I actually have a couple a couple of clips and I may have to pull down the volume on these, but um, I do know. Hold on a second, let me see if I can pull up some of these clips. Yeah, don't get pull down the volume on some of these, but uh, this one is. I'm not going to do the drum solo that you did. I'm not going to do that one again. Uh, this is. I guess this is from. I don't know what tour this was. This is Rock and Rio. Let's go. Would you please welcome on vocals Miss Lynn Mabry? Uh, that's i mean that's amazing i mean that is just truly truly amazing actually i did have one more it's about similar length uh i want to play this and then we'll talk a little bit about this here it looked like so much fun it was yeah it did look amazing this one is doesn't look as fun but it's pretty intense uh this is you and him this is a clip calling you a copy machine that needs some fixing in a little cafe just around the bend. It's a lot. Oh, it's, 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 it's like a very, very emotional. I could tell it's just like one of these yeah. things where it's like, uh, you know, because you have performed with a lot of people that are no longer with us um, that were considered iconic legends. And, and the fact that you are just in the mix of all of that um, mm-hmm. speaks volumes to your talent, to your mindset, to your dedication, to your craft, and just right. how people just the best of the best. Clapton, Elton John, George Michael, how all Sheila E, how all of them gravitated to you because they were like, you were like the polish on all this. Yeah, you were clearly feeding each other. Yeah. So let's every performance. Let's talk about how you know your relationship with how you got involved with George Michael and exactly you know how, how that all came to be. Oh, good question. Um, oh God, I'm just trying to remember because there's so many. There's there's a few people that I've worked with that that helped me. Like I want to say it was. Um, oh my God, God forgive me with my mind and the names, but um, one of the managers at the time, or I don't know if he was an R person, but he had heard about me and um, said that you know we're doing these auditions for George Michael. And if you're interested, so I literally came in on the ground level with all the 300 or 250, something like that women. Um, So I just like auditioned. That was one of the few people that I actually auditioned for. Um, And that's kind of how it wasn't any, you know, it it was just, hey, I I know you're a singer, you know, throw you in and see what you can do kind of a thing. Um, but yeah, that was a real big blessing. I had so much fun. I did two tours with him. 
uh, fake tour, cover to cover, oh, maybe three. Um, and uh, it was one. Oh, my sister's on. That's my baby sister. So proud of you. Oh, I love you, honey. Yeah. So just so blessed. Absolutely. Just. It's just. I, I don't know. I don't know what to say, y'all. It's just I'm I'm grateful, and it was a lot of fun, and I was very skinny. I, that was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's let's do a let's do a couple of uh, let's do a couple of quick hits. Um, because I mean, obviously, we've got uh, some things. Let's talk about tape heads for a second. Yeah. The movie tape heads. John Cusack and Tim Robbins and the movie tape heads. Yes, and, uh, we were fly girl. They were fly girls. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, how did you get involved in this movie? Um, let's see. Somebody, uh, I, that was another one of those phone calls. I can't, again, I don't remember exactly the person who recommended me, um, but it was a recommendation. It may have been like Bernie connection. It possibly, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Um, yeah, I just remember the beginning of it. It was just, we were doing the song and then they said, oh, you know, actually we're gonna do a couple of uh, cameos. We'd like to do a couple of cameos in, you know, the film itself. And so the girls that I'm singing with, I actually sang with in the studio. And then we went on stage and we did that too. And I guess it was for the soundtrack, which I didn't know. Um, but yeah, so we were Fly Girl. That was so much fun. Uh, one really quick fun story um, is that there's this one uh, scene when we did the Roscoe Chicken and Waffle. Right. <laughs> And whoever the guy that was directing, there were all white people in this re restaurant. And I went over to the guy, I said, excuse me, I apologize if I'm out of another way. I said, but this does not look like a Roscoe chicken and waffle. We don't have any black people in here. He said, oh my God, I never thought of that. Thank you. We've got two black people in the-, in the Two. two. <laughs> we got two in there, but besides us. <laughs> It was so, it was fun. We had a good time, and we did it in front of a live audience. Uh, that funny. that particular scene, yeah, that was fun. Uh, let's see another quick hit. Okay, he, he, this is not actually a quick hit. This is a this is a general question. Hmm. You no. have found your way on on a lot of Japanese artist albums, and I know hmm. a lot of these uh, are the same uh, art, it's the same Nami, um, Nami A, and the media bond that was Ryuichi Sakamoto. He's the guy who did uh, um, um, oh my God, see, brain cells are just crazy. Well, how did you get involved with all these Japanese artists? How did this connection work? Well, there was a couple of connections. Um, one was a Kenji's connection, Kenji Sano, who was producing a couple of this stuff or was in the band. He had heard about me and kind of got the gig um, with that. Um, he, uh, let's see, there was another, um, oh, that was another situation. I had done uh, a, a commercial, a and commercial for uh, Masai, no, oh, what's her name? Help, I know Kasha, if she was watching, she'd be able to tell me. But anyway, I did this uh, commercial and sang on this commercial and then one of the producers knew another producer who was TK. TK produced Namie and uh, there was another one. And so what happens is, is like they hear you and then they ask you to do it. Then someone else hears you doing that record and then they ask you to do it. And then I had the opportunity, which was really wonderful, um, they, because they knew I was uh, working with and managing Sheila at the time. So they were like, hey, you know, we can you help us get Sheila on this situation? So I asked Sheila, I said, you want to go on tour with Namie? She was like, heck yeah, let's do it. And then before you know it, we were writing. And so we wrote a couple songs on her record. Really? We took, yeah. And then she oh. wrote some songs and then we performed the songs that we wrote with Nami. Oh, wow. Wow. Nothing, nothing but God. No, I have not listened to any of these artists and uh, I, I feel ashamed to, to admit that. But mm -hmm. the reality of it is, is are you having to sing in Japanese oh. on any of these? Or? Sometimes. Sometimes I did and sometimes I didn't. Um, a lot of it, most of it was in, in English that we sang. Um, uh, when I sang with um, uh, Ryuichi Sakamoto, the Media Bond tour, y'all forgive me and all you Italian speaking people forgive me, but there was a song that we were supposed to learn a little piece, each of us, Keisha and I were supposed to learn in Italian, just a little couple of lines, about four or five lines. 
I was having the worst time. I couldn't figure it out. I was trying. I was trying to read it phonetically and I was trying to remember it. And by the time, you know, we were ready to do it live, it was just live. I just had to fudge it. So I could have been saying the dog was in the store Eating and rolling around on the carpet with a candle. <laughs> I, but I, my presentation on that Thing I was presenting that sucker like I whatever, but no, um, but yeah. So um, I did um, Ryuichi Sakamoto. I did. I was on tour with him for probably three months straight in Japan. Love Japanese people. Love Japanese food. Love Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. well, you know, at the time it was a little rough because they didn't. A lot of people were not used to you know us black folks taking a cab, and I was trying to get cabs, and nobody's. <laughs> when was it when was this um let's see media bond i think was 1986 wow something mm. like that um and i did uh the that was 1999 and 2000 <clears throat> because we did her uh genius or something 2000 album um and uh who else did i see on there she really what's an equivalent in the United States for Namie in Japan, as far as like her, how big she is. Over um, I was going to say probably like Taylor Swift. What? Really? Wow. Baby, wow. We had, there were sold out stadium shows everywhere. I don't. Everywhere. Sold out stadium everywhere. Wow. That's just amazing to me. Well, we, uh, there's like a, a Japanese funk band that we talk about all the time here called Ender Carey. Mm. And uh, they are phenomenal. Uh, the, they they started out. Uh, it's Yoshi Demoto, uh, and he was in this band called Kinky Kids, and then he <laughs> went over to Ender Carey, and he did this whole funk thing. And they are massive, massive, massive band over there. Nice. Like every single time that they talk, they talk about us over there in Japan. They mm. talk about us because we're mentioning him on the show. Like the website just comes to a crawl. They, they break like the internet. Tens of thousands of people <laughs> just, just hammered out. This is awesome. it's so weird to say. I, I can't believe she's that big over there. That's incredible. Right, we, got, wow. we got a wow. couple more hits, a couple more hits for you. This is a good one. Uh let's talk about Stevie Nicks. Hmm. We, we, we're, this is this is gonna be called this is a rock block okay. because we uh and not everybody's on this represented here on this slide, but Stevie Nicks, right. Fleetwood Mac. Okay. Mick Jagger, yep. we already talked about Don Henley, uh, yep. Steve Perry, and Neil Sean of Journey. Mm -hmm. um, let, let's talk about the Stevie Nicks Fleetwood Mac. Mix. Okay, Stevie Nicks Fleetwood Mac. I was on tour with George Michael. We were in the same hotel with Fleetwood Mac at the Kapinski in Germany. It happened to come in. They were doing a show somewhere else. We were doing. We kept to come in at the same time. We were in the lobby, kind of. I kind of caught my eye with the other singer, uh, Sharon Ceylani. And so we were just talking, oh, I'm with this, oh, I'm with that, oh, well, this is it. And so she introduced me to everyone and we just kind of just started visiting at the hotel in the lobby. And mm. then Sharon and I exchanged numbers. That was that, next thing I know, you know, Sharon and I, we kept in contact. Um, and then she calls me and she goes, oh, um, Fleetwood Mac is looking for another singer because some, I think it was her sister-in-law, some, somebody couldn't do something. And so I'm like, sure. So I went and did the gig and got the gig, did the thing with, I believe Fleetwood Mac was first. Oh my God. I think Fleetwood Mac was first. And then Stevie was like, I'm doing a solo record and time and space tour. We did that's the tour. A, wow. That's and a that's big pictures. Yeah. And in the middle, that picture with the shorts, that's Sheila's brother, Peter Michael right there. Wow. And um, and then uh, to the left of me, that's Eddie M, who was with Sheila with all the glamorous life stuff. And then to the right, for that's Sharon. And then to the right of Sharon, um, that's Cat Gray. So he uh -huh. was, and then the other gentlemen, they were the uh, uh, they had a band called Venice, killer band, killed it, killed it, fun, fun, fun. Um, Let's see. Now I'm just going to keep moving because I know time is 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 of the essence. Oh, it's, it's, it's right. Let's, the time so is Mick yours. Jagger, Mick Jagger. I was working. Oh God, who was I working with at the time when I was doing Mick? When I did Mick, I was working with someone who again saw me. Uh, oh oh oh, Jimmy Rip. Jimmy Rip. So Jimmy Rip 
Um, he knew me from other stuff and I had done a couple of sessions with other people with him and he says, oh, I'm producing some stuff on Mick Jagger and I think you would be great. I was like, heck yeah. And next thing I know, I am on tour with Mick Jagger or his uh, uh, solo tour. <laughs> and then before that, Neil Sean literally was just a session. Never met him, nothing. Someone called me to do a session. I found out he was Neil Sean, I did it. Steve Perry, funny enough, Steve Perry was my neighbor. We uh, lived in, yeah, we lived in the same condo building. Wow. And during the <laughs> earthquake, uh, two friends that I had met that lived up there, which are both actors and actresses, uh, Jack and Beth Coleman, they lived upstairs and we got really close or whatever. So we were friends. Um, they knew my daughter and whatever. So we were, and so we had that big Northridge earthquake and mm. everything was black, dark, couldn't see nothing. And here comes two bodies with flashlights knocking on our door. Lynn, are you in there? And it was Jack and Steve Perry. They both rescued my daughter and I out of our <laughs> out of our condo and ended up getting to know him downstairs while we were all on the street. That's how I met Steve Perry. Well, wow. Not every day you get rescued by the lead singer of Journey. Right. <laughs> I do have to ask though. I do. I do want to step back to Mick Jagger because at any point in time, every single time that anybody thinks of Mick Jagger and especially the Rolling Stones, the first person that comes to mind, the background vocalist, is Mary Clayton. Yes. And and Mary Clayton's iconic background vocal work on "Give Me oh. Shelter." That mm -hmm. probably one of the first people to do that high whistle note <laughs> type of thing. Right. Where, I can do it. I'm not even going to pretend. Oh my God. It's, mm. it's just, it's one of the most iconic vocal moments in Rolling Stones history. Yeah. Any of that stuff, I mean, do you ever feel like you are you familiar with previous background vocalist work with a particular artist and you feel like, man, I, I just, I don't mm, yeah, that. not, not really. But for Mick, I met Mick when I was 12. He was in my house. Oh. That's in the book. Ha! Can't tell you more. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Well, it's book coming out. But really, I, uh, my mom knew, uh, I mean, because of Sly, um, Mick was an entourage that came with him in my house. My mom cooked gumbo for them. And that's how I met him. And so when I took, when we were at rehearsal with Mick, <laughs> I will tell you this part. We were with Mick and I said, Mick, I said, I know you probably don't remember me. Um, I met you years ago. I was very young. He says, oh, my God, did I? Mm, you too? <laughs> I said, no. Oh my but, God. but again, it's like six degrees of separation. Nine, mm. six, twelve, whatever you want to call it. It was it's just like there's so many people that, you know, kind of weave, you know, themselves in and out of my life and vice versa. You need to have a rock and roll six degrees of separation for you. You you are like the Kevin Bacon of music. Uh, it, it is like you are tied to everything. It's ridiculous. And everyone. Yeah. All right. So one one more quick hit. One and, more. That, and this is a this is kind of a little bit of a group. Obviously, we got Brandon Flowers here from um the Killers, Daughtry, Shine Down. How did you get into the rock mix? Um obviously. The Killers are, I, I guess, alternative rock more. But how did you? I need mean, one of your people to find out who the producer was for um, Brandon Flowers. I need someone to go on real quick because Jeff Page is the uh, what? Well, Jeff Page and Cami Mattingly are our uh, go-to producers mean, well, because that's Brandon Flowers, the desired effect. Find out who the producer it's was. The connection of all three actually, and Hosier is not on there, and that was the fourth connection. Yeah, Hosier. I actually right. had that photo. I don't know it's why it's all good. It's all good. So yeah. there, there lies someone who knew of me, had heard my voice, worked with me, and recommended me, and I did that one. And then when I did one record, then they said, oh, we're doing, I think Brandon Flowers might have been the first one. And I did that with my daughter, uh, Junie's and my daughter, and I did it with Jackie Goucher, which I love, and Judith Hill again. Um, and so we did that one. And the next thing I know, we're doing the shine down. Yeah. And then Ariel Rock Shade. Huh? Yeah. Ariel Rock Shade. Yep. Ariel. 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 That's one of them. There's another one. 
There's another one. So okay. Greg, his name is Greg. That's okay. Right, well, go ahead. Forgive me. Uh, right. Well, that will be in the book. But um, <laughs> same thing with Daughtry. You know, like they're like, oh, we heard that you worked with da 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 da, and so you know, you want to do these songs. And I went to the studio, and um, and that one was with uh, Cherie Brown, and I did Daughtry together, and. I my daughter did that one too. But anyway, yeah. So again, you guys, it's almost like it's like word of mouth. It's I work with someone, someone likes it, they you know refer me to someone else. That literally has been my career, y'all. I've only auditioned for maybe three people in my entire career. Wow. And I and we we've covered a lot. We've covered yeah. a lot in this two hours, but one one that we did not cover that we kind of just gla- what there was a few that we did not cover at all. Um, Bet Midler, I am interested in, in you know what, what what exactly were you working on with Bet and um, um the the uh, manager that we had the tour manager for George Michael was tour managing for Bet Midler, so he recommended me for that when I was working with Sheila and I got the call right in the middle of rehearsal. And that's the one when I was like a rap during the sex symbol thing. But anyway, uh, got a call to do it. I came in, sang with her while they were rehearsing. They literally had their band and everything already. And I sang with her. And she just said that she told him that she wanted, Alan, uh, she wanted um, uh, another voice, you know, just to blend in. Uh, thank you. That's my brother, Rod. Thank you, baby. And so um, I got the gig. And um I was singing with Sheila and I went back and I was like, oh, Sheila, oh my gosh. She goes, girl, you better take that gig. And so <laughs> it worked out. But it was just, it was wonderful. I was an honorary harlot. I didn't have to do any of the major dances and I just sat with the band, came up on stage a couple of times with the whole band there, but enjoyed. She's one of my, she was one of my favorite artists to perform with and for. <sighs> I, we covered a lot. We did. Um, <laughs> all, almost all of it. I hope I don't. Know. Know. Is there anybody that that we that we did not cover that you really want to do a quick shout out of? Because you had there was there was quite a bit in there. It's quite a bit. I, I think I covered okay. everyone, and, and what I didn't cover, it will be covered. All it right. will be so covered. When is the what is the title of this book again, and when is it coming out? It's called Mothership Connected. It is. Uh, mm-hmm. Publishers are looking at it now. Um, Seth Nevlet is the creator. He's the curator. He's the historian. He's the one that has kept. Um, and I, this is the only book I am going to tell you. Lynn has done so many. Oh, thank you, Sheila. Yeah, Sheila. For those listening on the on the Funked Up app, <laughs> Sheila E says Lynn has done some with so many wonderful artists. She is simply an amazing singer, songwriter, arranger, artist. We love her. Yes. I love you too. Um, you too, Sheila. <laughs> Thank you, mommy. So this uh, book, Mothership Connected, is going to come out. There are a lot of books that are out that people are talking about the whole mm-hmm. Funkadelic experience. I will tell everyone right now, this particular one is the most accurate. Mm. And That's this nice. focus are the women of Parliament of Funkadelic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. all I got. And I, oh, and I so the sudden, so dark. just oh, it's dark now. It better that be makes, accurate. That makes two, <laughs> oh, that wow. makes two funk, uh, Parliament Funkadelic books that I'm looking forward to. That one, Mothership Connected. And I don't remember the name of Danny Bedrosian's book, but Danny Bedrosian's book, uh, he's the keyboardist for Parliament Funkadelic now, mm-hmm. the, white, the, white, the white guy at the back. Ooh, uh, I've never met him. He, he is actually creating a, uh, a book an actual novel book that has every single album, every single person that's recorded on it, the recording dates, kind of like Dwayne Tudor's of version of Prince's, the wow, Prince book. Okay. But he's doing like a full, complete documentarian. Wow. Thing. And I was like that. I can't even imagine what that even looks like. Me? Right. Uh, Cause that those recording sessions, uh, every story I've ever heard has always been just madness. So Good luck with that. Awesome. <laughs> Good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> but I definitely cannot wait to hear uh, to read your book, and please make sure well, that's that not, it's not my book. I am just one of the principals in the book. I am right. I am writing a book. Actually, it's almost done, but it has nothing to do with 
Well, definitely. We definitely want to hear that. And obviously, if you want to hear some of uh, her latest work, and I'm not sure if you've got more things in there, this, this, well, obviously, we've got the, the green screen. Jeff Page, you want to hold it up? We can both actually hold it up, uh -oh. um, actually. Which, but uh, Which one? Am I in trouble? That's right. Oh, here. Yeah. Funky, y'all. Funky. funky. Sheila E. and the and H. We, we, we saw them in Atlanta, and it was absolutely fantastic. Phenomenal, and the thing that I love, and I've seen a bunch of, um, I've seen a bunch of comments in here about people bragging about how wonderful the Arizona show was that you got that you were telling me about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of people There's talking about it. A lot of Arizona comments here talking about how amazing it is. If yeah. she and the E Train are in your area, please go. First off, go. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that, and I told Jeff Page about this, uh, one of the things that I had told him was that um, I appreciated the fact that they focused on the music on the new album. Right. That it's, trust me. Okay. I've seen Sheila. I, I, I don't know how many times I want to say I've seen her at least, at least a dozen times over the years. And I love, love bizarre. I, lo I love all the hits. I love yep. the hits. Of course. Who doesn't love the hits? But to be able to hear a concert that was primarily focused on the new music and it was such, it was so friggin' strong. That was amazing. Uh, Sheila, I promise you, I promise you there will be a review up on Funkatopia.com before the week is out. And I apologize it took me so long, but this album is everything unreal. Everything. If you haven't, yeah. as far as I know, uh, before. I guess before just recently, you could only get these at the shows. Right. Now you can actually get them. Now you can get them. Now you I can. Get them. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I know that there was supposed to be a, a specific date date, um, but definitely go to Sheely.com because you can get the one that is signed by her. Right. Not all of us. You have to come to the show to get us all to sign it. And I'm not just saying this because Sheila is here. Sheila is here. I'm. I'm telling you, this is one of the best Sheila E albums in a very, very long it time. It really is. It I agree. really is, no doubt. And it's it's in it's in my playlist. It is always I hear I'm always catching this. So Miss yeah. America was hot. So America was hot, all this stuff was hot, but there was mm -hmm. some, there's something about the jazz flow and the instrumental stuff that's happening on this. Uh mm -hmm. it's just y'all hit a recipe on this this beast right I'm here just gonna say, on guitar michael gabriel on uh Dave raymond oh, my, yeah. mckinley on, mm -hmm. on keyboards bertrand curtis um on drums sheila e and and also on keyboards roseanne delamonte let me tell you together everybody is and then yours truly but it's a great and the, and the show like i said it's one of my favorite um show performances that we do yeah when i whenever i hear the songs on it 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 makes me think of the show. Yay! You know, I mean, that was the point. It, everything is live. You know, they yeah. you recorded everyone live. She did it phenomenal. But every time I hear the song, I think of the show. I think of those moments, and it's like I'm just so I'm glad I was there. So, so grateful so. that you guys enjoyed it. And Such a great show. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, let me tell you. Thank you so much for right. coming on the show because it has been an absolute honor. It is not often that you get somebody who has done as much as you have uh that is as humble and as gracious with your time as you've been tonight we it's been that. phenomenal we're severely honored to have you on here and uh it's my pleasure and thank you so much for all that you do for you know us and all the musicians and everything thank you it's been great and Anytime, it. always give our love to Sheila, give our love to Michael, give our love to Gilbert, or the whole crew, whole uh, family, whole the whole <laughs> family. family. Yes, we'll do, yeah. we'll do. Thank you again. Thank you again, Lynn. We will talk Thank to you. everybody for joining us. Whoever did now, is this gonna be? I'm just asking. Like, oh yeah, someone see it if if it's absolutely it's, okay. Luckily, we were not kicked off of Facebook, so that means that this whole right. entire broadcast will stay on Facebook.com slash Funkatopia and also YouTube.com slash Funkatopia. Great. And then tomorrow, you will actually be able to hear the audio version of this on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Odyssey, all the big major players. So anywhere that you listen to your podcast, just look for Funkatopia Live. You'll be able to find it there if you missed any of this. And it's been an amazing show. So you, if you weren't here since the beginning, you've missed a lot. <laughs> a little bit. 
<laughs> just a hair. Just a hair. Thank you both so much, Jeff. It's great seeing you, Chris. Thank you for everything. Thank you for all your help. Absolutely. Then, yeah, Absolutely. we'll talk. We'll talk. Well, yeah, it was wonderful. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye, Lynn. Bye. <laughs> oh my gosh, what an amazing! Uh, oh my gosh, what an amazing Man. individual! Oh my god, just um, fire. I just, <sighs> amazing. I I don't know. I. You know, a, a loss of words is an understatement because I'm just. Uh, uh. I mean, some people that have accomplished that, uh, you would think would be wrapped in ego and um, so humble. Yeah, it's just the it's just lovely. And, and hearing her talk and he, I hear her voice, I hear her sing. Like just her voice resonates in her speech, which is just crazy. <laughs> and then thinking back of all the records and all the music I've ever heard with her in the background, with her voice on it, and not even remembering some of them and going, oh my gosh. And some I didn't even know, because of course, at that age, why would I know? And it's just going back and man, it's just. Uh, uh, well, again, wow. if you missed any of it, you can tune in tomorrow on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Odyssey, all the uh, the fine the fine locations and everything. Um, much love to Lynn Mabry. Much love to Michael Clip Payne uh, from mm -hmm. Parliament Funkadelic being in the mix. Sheila yeah. E., thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, Sheila, we're still looking for you on the show. We'd love to have you on the show. You said, I know I talked to you in Atlanta. You said, I don't have anything to talk about. You do. So when you're ready. You do. We're ready. <laughs> we're ready for you. Uh, we're ready for you, love. Uh, also, a couple uh, closing announcements uh, before we go. And that is, A, all you fine folks that requested the debut CD of Van Hunt last week, uh, the Patreon supporters, they, that's out. Uh, all of them are shipped. So you guys, most of you probably already have them. If you don't have them, uh, you, you should get them any day now. Uh, if you are a Patreon supporter, patreon.com slash Funkatopia. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Funkatopia. Thank you, Jeff Page, for putting that scroller up. If you are a Patreon supporter, you can um, actually, and you do not have the original issue of Musicology, the original, and uh, well, some of these are in rappers, but they're still open. I have eight copies of Musicology, Prince's Musicology album, eight copies. So if you're a Patreon supporter and you do not have a physical copy of Musicology, be sure that you chat me up on patreon.com slash Funkatopia. Just chat me up and say, I want one of those CDs. Uh, actually, I have seven because Lynn said she wanted one. So I've got to send one to Lynn. Right. <laughs> uh, so I have seven of them. So the first seven Patreon supporters that want the Musicology CD just... Uh, shoot me a message in Patreon and I'll get them to you next week. We are not on the air. We are off the air. So uh, do not tune in because you've got a lot of stuff to listen to. You'll be fine. <laughs> I know I owe you guys a concert, <laughs> but we're going to bypass that. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that's right. Jeff page is doing a live concert. Uh, that's right. <laughs> you did say that. <laughs> mm. Yeah, All right. Well, it's, yeah, it's it's coming. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you so so much for tuning in. I hope you had a fantastic time. A little bit of Michael Gabriel. He's our new theme song, with his blessing, by the way. Good night. I feel like I got to do it one more time, without me talking over it. I feel like that's important. Because everybody needs to hear Michael Gabriel. This is Radioactive Girl. This is such a jam. One more time.